I had the, the deepest, most profound inferiority complex I ever heard of. I went around telling myself that I didn't amount to anything, that I hadn't any brains. And after a while, I began to realize that people were agreeing with me because it is a fact that people will uh, take you at your own self-appraisal. Unconsciously, they will. And I just didn't feel that I could succeed in anything. I believe, and I'm sure you do also, that we can live life and love it. Furthermore, we have it within us to stand up to all the difficulties inherent in this life and overcome them all, rise above them. We have the built-in ability to be victorious. Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, a near-legendary philosopher of our time. There is hardly a person in the English-speaking world who has not heard of his power of positive thinking. But does it surprise you that this enormously successful minister was once a shy self-doubter who felt doomed to a life of failure? This program is part of an exciting new series designed to increase your confidence in yourself and your awareness of the world around you. In the next 40 minutes, you will hear the story of Norman Vincent Peale as he looks back on nearly nine decades of life and recalls his transformation from a reticent young man to a powerful public speaker and world-renowned author of such books as The Power of Positive Thinking and The True Joy of Positive Living. Shyness early in life may be painfully familiar to many of us. I find that I have lots of company. Many children seem to be beset with this abnormal shyness. And that was something I had to get over. And I'd over it until I was about a sophomore in college. There was a professor at Ohio Western University where I was a student by the name of Ben Arneson. He was a gentle, kind-hearted man. But one day he kept me after class and he said, Peel, I'm going to lay it out straight for you. And he growled and tried to be as gruff as he possibly could. Later he told me that it was hard for him to work up to this kind of meanness. But he said, you know, you, you, you're a scared rabbit. Now I know that you know this stuff in this class. But when I call on you, you get red in the face, you shift from one foot to the other, you're uncertain in what you say, and you're horribly embarrassed. Now, why don't you get with it and be a man? He said, your father's a minister, you've been brought up in a Christian home or with the religious parents, why don't you practice that? And he said, if you do, you'll amount to something. If you don't, you never will. Well, you know, this irritated me. And I went out in front of the building and decided whether I should resign from the university and get away from such fellows as Ben Arneson. But then I decided I'd say a prayer. And I can remember exactly where I did it, on the fourth step from the bottom of Great Chapel. I said to the Lord something like this, Dear Lord, you can take a drunk and make him sober. You can take a thief and make him honest. Now, can't you take a person like me with this abnormal attitude and make me normal too? Now, I expected something terrific to happen to me, but it didn't. But I had a, a feeling of peace and a kind of a happy feeling that it was going to work out. In other words, I believed in the prayer. I visualized myself as getting over this. Then a couple of days later, another professor gave me a book called The Great Sayings of Ralph Waldo Emerson. And he said, get acquainted with Emerson. 
And then another time he gave me another book, uh, uh, Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. He says, get acquainted with these two great writers because they know something about the greatness of the human mind. You'll find that you are greater than anything that can happen to you. I remember that phrase. It's lived with me ever since, and I've tried to live up to it. Dr. Peel has fostered a life of distinction from a perfectly ordinary childhood and family background. He had as his only particular advantages two strong, intelligent parents whom he remembers fondly. Well, I was born in a little town called Bowersville in Greene County, Ohio, about eight miles from Xenia, 20 miles from Dayton, and about 35 miles from Cincinnati. My father had been a doctor of medicine, and he later became a minister because he developed a serious illness, and he had a mother who told him that if God would spare him, he should become a preacher. He was a good doctor of medicine. He was health commissioner of one of the biggest Midwestern cities when he was just beyond 21. He was vigorous. He was a wonderful orator or speaker. Very simple, very loving, a man's man. I got the impression from him that uh, being a preacher was man-sized stuff. That's the type of man he was. My mother was a very intelligent uh, woman. She, she could read a page of copy in a book and uh, almost repeat it verbatim. I was astonished. She had a very retentive memory. She was poetic. She knew by heart more poetry than any person I ever knew. She was Irish. Her maiden name was Delaney. And the Delaney's came right out of the Emerald Isle. And she had all of the sentiment and the emotion uh, of the Irishman. And one of the great joys of my life was ultimately to take her there and see the place where her father was born. She was a terrific public speaker. Had she lived in, in this generation, she could have been elected to Congress because she had the art of persuasion. She was a remarkable woman. Dr. Peel's remarkable career as a pastor began inauspiciously, but prospered with his willingness to take on tough ministerial assignments. As with many of us, he found the idea of challenge stimulating, and as he tackled and won out over problems, his self-confidence grew. I was very fortunate. I have had four churches in my career, and every one of them was down at the bottom when I took it. In fact, they were almost finished. They were about to close them up. I wouldn't take a job that is really up, going strong, because when you do, you have to keep it at that level or lift it to a higher level. But if you take a job that is on the way out, that is just about as low as you can get it, then you are fortunate because the bottom is a very propitious place. It means you can't go any further down. The only direction you can go is up. So I had this little church in Rhode Island. There had been a minister there who, who divided the church and got people at odds and ends with each other, and they were thinking of closing the church. So they gave me the, the job. It, it was nothing, no possibilities in it. They thought, but we were fortunate to, in building it up and making it strong. Then, then the next place I had was a church in Brooklyn. They had uh, f 40 members, and I could never find more than about 20 of them. And the first Sunday I went into this church, the sexton, a young boy named Harold, was actually taking the front pew and breaking it up for kindling wood. And I said to him, why are you doing that? He said, I got to have some kindling. I said, don't you touch those pews. I'm going to fill those pews with people. Well, he said, they've never been filled with people. But they were. And ultimately, we built a new church there that uh, seated about uh, eight or 900 people, and it was filled up every Sunday. 
Then I went to Syracuse, where the church was down to uh, about a, a, a dispirited handful in the church. It's one of the most beautiful buildings I ever saw. It was constructed of windows on either side, and it was a glorious place when the sun was shining. It was magnificent. They had a balcony, but the only use for the balcony was a big ladder that the sexton had laid across the pews. And I said, get that ladder out of there. We're going to put people up in there. And we went after the students of Syracuse University and finally got the church filled. His next important success came quickly as he found a partner in life, Ruth Stafford. Theirs is a classic love at first sight story. And their meeting is described by Dr. Peel in this romantic recollection. One Sunday morning, I was holding a, a committee of students in the main sanctuary of the church after the service. And I was standing facing the rear door on Genesee Street. And as I say, the church was filled with sunlight through those glorious windows. When all of a sudden, the door at the, the main entrance on Genesee Street opened and silhouetted in the sunlight stood a girl. I didn't know her name. I would never saw her before in my life. She was totally new to me, but immediately I knew that was the girl for me. So she was waiting for somebody in my meeting, and I watched these two girls meet, and I contrived to, to shake her by the hand. And she says, though I don't know whether this is true or not, she said, I held her hand a fraction of a second longer than was necessary. When Ruth married Dr. Peel, she brought to his life the love, strength, and support he has relied upon over the decades to help him make the hard career and personal choices. We were invited or called to this big church in Los Angeles. At the time, it was one of the few largest churches in the United States. It could have been numerically the largest church in the in the country and it was well supported it was a secure beautiful opportunity and they offered all kinds of inducements uh, that uh, were connected with the church but at the same time i was offered this dismal down run down at the heels church on lower fifth avenue Anybody in his right mind would have taken this beautiful church on the West Coast rather than this rundown one on the East Coast. But I still had this notion that if I went to the West Coast, I would have to deal with success. Whereas if I went to this East Coast, I would have to deal with failure. And if I could bring success out of failure, I would be serving the Lord uh, better and I would grow in the process. So I went home one noon and my wife said to me, you've got to make a decision. I'd strung this out over a month. And she said, we're going to pray. Now, I know you can get a decision by prayer. Because we prayed for about three or four hours. And finally she said, did you get an answer? I said, yeah, I think I did. She said, I've got an answer. I said to her, what is the answer? Oh, no, she said, you must give the answer. So I said, well, the answer is to go to New York and not to California. She said, go right to the telephone, call a man up and tell him because that is the right thing to do. You're going down there to a very tough, maybe impossible job. But if we think in terms of possibilities rather than impossibilities, we'll be able to turn it around. And in that minute, I knew that that decision was right for sure. And I never had any question about it over the 50 years that I was there. No regrets. How many of us can look back over our lives with such certainty? And yet Dr. Peel achieved his unshaking self-confidence through persistent adherence to a simple technique, which he calls positive imaging. 
it's psychologically true that there's a deep tendency in human nature to become almost precisely like that which we imagine or image ourselves as being. That is, if a person puts himself down and thinks he hasn't got what it takes and that he has only an ordinary mentality, he will probably work out to be just about that. If, on the contrary, he has a humble uh, yet realistic uh, picture of himself in his own mind, this will work out just about as visualized. Now, I don't know how I picked this idea up in my early life. Perhaps I got it from my father because he always thought that way. He would say to me, son, if you have a tough job, see its possibilities. Don't see all of its disadvantages. And I remember he had a phrase, to every disadvantage, there is always a corresponding advantage. Now, he said, sometimes it'll be hard to see those advantages and because the disadvantages are more acute and more fearful and they shake their spears at you. But he said, if you see the advantage, then you will very likely be able to develop it. Now, in the churches that I had, there wasn't anybody going to the church. They were run down. They were uh, uh, disconsolate and everything. There was nothing propitious about it. But I remember walking up and looking at the church and going inside and looking at the empty place. And I would tried to follow my father's teachings or what I had picked up somewhere, that if I saw that church filled with people, not for my ego, but for the good that could be done to them if you got them in there. You can't teach Christianity to people that are not there. So that's a very simple fact. You had to get them there. You never get anywhere speaking to empty seats. If you're in a business, it, it, it applies it's the same. If you run a grocery store and there are no customers coming, what's the matter? Uh, you, you've got to image customers coming in there, and then you've got to arrange your merchandise in an attractive way, and if people don't come to you, you go out and see people. Get acquainted with them. Be a friend to them. Let them know you want to help them, and you'll gradually bring them in. And I have tramped the streets of Brooklyn. I used to know every fence post, every telephone pole, every house along every street in Flatlands and then Flatbush in the old days. And I'd walk up and ring doorbells. And a big tough man would come to the door and I'd say to him, Sir, I happen to be a young fellow trying to get ahead in the world and I've got a church around the corner and do you folks ever go to church? Well, we don't go very often. And I'd say, well, you come over there and we sing these old hymns, and it's a friendly place, and you'll hear a message that is designed to help you. Why don't you come along? And a few Sundays later, I'd shake hands with him at the door, and he'd say, you're a nice young fella, and you're trying to do something. You can count on me. And he'd stick with me and maybe be a member of that church for 50 years. That's the way you do it. You visualize, and then you go out and see the people, and then you work, and you think, and think some more, and work some more, and believe some more. You've always got to believe a, a failure into success. It's not enough, says Dr. Peel, just to see ourselves as we'd like to be. We must make a tenacious effort to behave as the people we'd like to be and want our children to become. It's hard work to set a constant example for children but it's the best way he knows to produce considerate, principled adults. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. 
That's the smartest, wisest thing ever said about the family. You have children. At first, you can see in front of them, and they don't pick it up. But you've got to be careful. When they get to be about two years of age, they begin to think. They're like antennae for a radio. They pick up everything that goes. And then they not only pick up what you say, but what is more dangerous, they pick up what you are. So if you want to raise decent, good children that turn out well, the basic way to do it is to be yourself what you want them to be because they're very likely going to be what you are. And if you fill the house with a good atmosphere, what do you mean by good? Well, a moral, upright uh, atmosphere. And the parents should show love between themselves because love itself is a healing property. And, and treat the children not as children. Treat them as people. My wife and I tried to have conversation at, at the table, uh, interesting, uh, that had ideas in it and concepts. And uh, we would discuss uh, politics, uh, religion, uh, world conditions and affairs, and uh, we'd have arguments. And everybody would get in the arguments. I remember my wife would say, now let's continue the argument in the kitchen as we wash dishes together. We can solve this matter. And we all knew that she was working us to help her with the dishes. But fortunately, all our children, they're now adults, and they're doing the same with their children. And uh, I don't want to brag, but... Uh, they all turned out well. They're good, upright, decent citizens. And I think if you image a family becoming that, you're on the way to creating it. Dr. Peel's philosophy of positive thinking inevitably comes back to his religious faith. I was speaking one night in Roanoke, Virginia, and a man came up to me and he told me, the following story. He said that uh, he was in the automobile parts business in Virginia and uh, had the entire state of, of uh, Virginia under his supervision in that selling program. But he became an alcoholic. And he was a complete, utterly defeated alcoholic. They sent him up to New York to see the greatest uh, expert in alcoholism in the United States at that time, Dr. Edward Silkworth, who worked at the town hospital in New York City. And uh, Dr. Silkworth gave him all the medical treatment, called him into his office, and he said, Now, Charles, I've got you clean, absolutely clean. Uh, there's no alcohol in you. But he said, uh, unfortunately, I am not able to reach a certain reservation in your mind. If I could take a scalpel and go in there and cut out this reservation, I, uh, you would never come back here again. But as it is, I'm sorry to say you'll probably come back. But Charles said, well, you're the greatest doctor in this field. Uh, no, he said, I'm not really. There is another doctor who has a tremendous skill. There's an alchemy and power in his hand that uh, is in no other. Well, Charles said, uh, who is this doctor? Oh, the doctor said, he's very expensive. You couldn't pay what he wants. Well, Charles said, I can raise money. Who is this doctor? No, he says, this doctor not only take all your money, he takes everything you've got. Well, Charles said, name him. And Silkworth said, the doctor I refer to is named Jesus Christ, and he keeps office in the New Testament. But he said, you haven't got what it takes 
to go to him and do what he tells you. You've got to completely give your whole self to him. Then he'll clean this alcoholism out of your mind. So Charlie left the hospital. And the, the only church he knew of in New York was mine because he'd been reading my book. So he found it. And it was about 11 o'clock at night. And it was rain mixed with snow. And he tried every door and they were all locked. Finally got around to the back door. And there was a mail slot. So he took one of his business cards out of his pocket. And he wrote on the back of it, Dear Dr. Jesus, I am Charlie Kennard, one of your unfaithful followers. Dr. Silkworth says that if I give myself completely to you, you can heal me of this terrible disease. So I hereby give myself to you. Signed, Charlie Kennard. Stuck it through the mail slot. Now, Charlie says that as he stood there in this downpour of rain mixed with snow, all of a sudden he felt hot on the top of his head. And this heat seemed to go all down through his body and out his feet. And he cried one minute and laughed the next. And he knew in that minute that he was healed. And he was. Never, once again, as long as he lived, did he even have the desire. Now, this is a miracle because it usually just doesn't happen this way. It's a long tedious, discouraging process. But he was healed that night by the power of the gospel, and he worked for guideposts for 40 years after that time. He handled our circulation in all the southern states. He was beloved in every state down south uh, because of what he had uh, become. So, when you talk about imaging and you talk about this power, uh, it's all there. Now, to a scientific generation, uh, they begin to ask questions. And I ask questions myself. But I've seen it displayed so many times that I have no doubt that under certain appropriate circumstances, this power will work in anybody, anywhere, at any time in connection with anything. Dr. Peel's belief in both the power of the projected image and the force of faith in the gospel is further illustrated in this story of a West Long Branch, New Jersey man named Harry DeCamp. Harry is what you might call a good old boy type. He's a big man physically. He was a next to being a professional golfer in New Jersey, one of the best golfers in the state. He was uh, in the insurance business and probably one of the few best insurance producers in New Jersey. Everybody loved him. He was an outgoing fellow. And he prided himself on the fact that he had never consulted a doctor. He was tough, healthy, vigorous. And then one day... He, he got to feeling badly. And he went to the doctor, and the doctor said, Well, Harry, uh, you better go over to the Long Branch uh, Medical Center. I don't like what I see. Well, he says, I don't need to go over there. But he finally did. And over there, they told him that he had a cancerous mass behind the gallbladder and that they'd have to send him up to to a big hospital in New York. His doctor was the man who had operated on Senator Hubert Humphrey. And he said, well, Mr. DeCamp, uh, there's nothing we can do for you. You go on back to, to West Long Branch and make yourself as comfortable as possible. In other words, go on back there and die. So Harry went back there and he sat looking into the television every day and thinking to himself I'm going to die so then somebody sent him a get well card 
And on this card, it says, have faith in God. That which is impossible with man is possible with God. Well, Harry said, uh, God uh, and I are on distant speaking terms. I never did anything for him. Why should he do anything for me? Then somebody sent him a copy of our magazine guidepost in which uh, there were two stories which showed, told about people who had imaged health and well-being and that that they had it had come to them. Then he got an idea. He began to image thousands of white cells, healthy white cells, cascading from his shoulders down into the area where were the unhealthy cancer cells. And he began to visualize these white cells as doing battle with these unhealthy cells. He says a hundred times a day he visualized this battle. And then one day he said to his wife, uh, I'm hungry. Now cancer is starvation disease. You lose your appetite. You can't eat. And she'd been giving him a cracker and a half a cup of tea. And she said, well, what do you want, Harry? He said, I want you to go out and get me a submarine sandwich. Well, she thought he was crazy. She called the doctor. She says, Harry wants a submarine sandwich. The doctor says, it's noontime. I'd like to have one myself. You go out and get him a submarine sandwich. And he ate it ravenously and asked for more. She was so concerned, she took him to the doctor. And the doctor said, we better take him over to the Long Branch Medical Center. They gave him a thorough examination. And they couldn't find any evidence of the disease. They took him up to the New York hospital. And they couldn't find it. This has been eight years ago. He lives a normal, healthy life. He plays golf again. Recently, he was in a tournament where I understood he became the champion of Monmouth County. He rides a bicycle many miles every day. He speaks uh, all over the United States telling his uh, experience. He uh, entertains visitors from every state in the United States and from countries abroad. He's written a book. He keeps up a constant uh, voluminous correspondence. He has helped untold people. He uh, is Harry DeCamp, a vigorous, vital, healthy, very well man. I think that imaging was responsible for his healing. I think he fell upon a scientific law. And I believe that if this can happen to one, it can happen to others. Harry DeCamp became one of the greatest believers and imagers I've ever met in my long experience. While acknowledging the differences among people in their goals and obstacles, Dr. Peel maintains his philosophy can work for anyone, as long as an investment of hard work, faith, and commitment is made toward achieving what he calls the true joy of living. The way to attain this true joy is to find yourself. Every one of us, I suppose, is different from everybody else. And yet there's a certain unifying factor in all human life. You've got to find yourself and then be true to yourself. Don't try to be somebody else. 
take your talents, your abilities, your failures, your weaknesses, and go to work with them. Uh, and if you tie them all together with faith, faith in God, faith in other people, faith in life itself, faith in the meaning of human existence, and faith in yourself, uh, you'll come out and achieve whoever you are and what you do in your own way, the true joy of living. Over the years, millions of people around the world have found wisdom, comfort, and inspiration from the teachings and writings of Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. I was uh, asked to write an autobiography. I had never intended to write such a book. But some people seem to think that... Uh, that what I could say in it would be helpful. And I sincerely tried to make it just that because I have learned from other people's lives and I never thought anybody could learn much from my, mine. But judging by the mail I've received over a good many years in great volume, some people have learned from it. So we've put it in a book called The True Joy of positive living. This is the true joy of life. The being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one. I found a purpose for my life that I truly believed in and over many years I've given myself to it. It has given me direction and meaning and the deep, true joy of living. Mm -hmm.